see everybody. So we're going to talk about abdominal aortic aneurysm. Where do we stand today? We're going to try and do this in 10 minutes. Let's see if this is working or not. We'll give you this time back. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. So I don't have any, uh, any disclosures. Sorry, this is very tricky. Uh... So there are still a lot of unresolved issues in treatment of abdominal aortic aneurysms. I think most of us who do AAAs realize, you know, how do we deal with the, with the hostile neck, the short neck, the large neck? This is really the holy grail of endovascular repair. This is where most of our failures happen when we uh, really do uh, procedures that are off, off IFU. Uh, we end up getting failures because there's a failure at the neck, uh, there's slippage of the graft, there's dilatation of the graft, and that's how you end up getting an endoleak and a failure. What's better, open versus endo? You know, what is the better long-term option? Uh, I can tell you, like, 10 years back, we were doing almost every case endovascularly. I mean, when I graduated, I was rarely doing any sort of open, uh, open surgery. But now I think that paradigm is shifting a little bit. You know, now we have good 8, 10, 12, 15-year data on, on endovascular repair, and we're starting to realize, well, that may not be the best thing for, for every single patient. So we'll, we'll, we'll kind of talk about it. And there's always been a continuous debate on, on, on small aneurysms, but unfortunately, there's no data to, uh, to answer this question. Dan, Dan will, will know the most dangerous size is a, is a, is a five centimeter. You know, in, in men, you're supposed to do repair 5.5, but we were, taught that, we were taught that five was the most dangerous because if you don't fix it, someone else is going to fix it for you. <laughs> so, so that might be the most dangerous. I still teach all my fellows and my, and my, and, and my residents the, the joke about that. So we have some current limitations with the devices that we have. Obviously, a neck length uh, has to be equal or greater than four millimeters, which is pretty short if you think about it. You know, you're, you're, you're hoping that the stent seals in four millimeters, and it kind of gives you a repair that's, that's long term. You know, that's the, that's the, that's the durability of the, of the repair. So that's a Z-Fen, and then if you use an endurant with, uh, with anchors, our diameters are still limited to 16 to 32 millimeters, and we cannot have a neck angulation, uh, you know, greater than uh, greater than 90 uh, 90 degrees. I'm not going to talk about any other limitations like like vessel sizes or stuff. I think those are those are those are pretty straightforward. But these are the main limitations of the of the devices. So this is just an endo anchor case that I that I did a little while for people who are not familiar with with endo anchors. It's a screw that kind of goes in. Um, there's there's some data about this that we'll that will that will talk about, and this is how you kind of fix the fix the graft to the to the wall where you where you have a fairly short uh, short neck. There are some people who routinely do this. Uh, some people who are more selective about doing this. I'm probably one of the more selective users, but it's not uncommon to see people who do endo anchors all the time. So the anchor data, you know, they had more than 900 patients in a in a registry that they followed, and they have a four year data out. So freedom from secondary procedures to treat type 1 endo leak was over 90%, almost 97%. And there was a positive SAC regression despite hostile anatomy. So, so that, you know, theoretically sounds good also because if your SAC is getting smaller, that means the SAC is getting uh, de-pressurized. Uh, de, uh, so that, uh, that in itself kind of sounds good. So if you have a 60% SAC regression, you know, the company says that that uh, theoretically may, be, uh, may, may lead to uh, better outcomes. And there was a freedom from aneurysm-related mortality based on kaplan meier curve, which is also very high, more than uh, more than ninety percent. So the nine the nine hundred patients. Now most of these patients had necks about ten millimeters or so, if I if I if I remember correctly. So it wasn't really short short neck, uh, but it was it was decent. Uh, they're actually going to go head on head to head with uh, with some of the other devices now to look at the sh really short necks, the four the four millimeter neck, and kind of compare ZFEN versus uh, Medtronic with uh, endo anchors, and we'll kind of see what that uh, what that data shows. Uh, talking about the ZFEN graph, this is a, this is the ZFEN graph for people who have not seen it or or used it, and and we have a five year result of the United States uh, uh, prospective multicentral trial, and their results were also pretty good. That 67 patients enrolled, 1.5 percent 30 day mortality at five years. Freedom from aneurysm related mortality was still 96 percent. They did have, they they did have some renal artery uh, issues, renal artery stenting issues early on, so you can see the. The number is a little bit low. The primary pain is 82%, but the secondary pain, if they occlude and you, you're still able to open them up at, at, at 95%. And they only had one type 1A endoleak, one type B, and two device migrations. They had no ruptures or conversion to open. So a five-year data looks, uh, looks quite encouraging, I think. So when you talk about snorkel or chimney complex, uh, complex cases, you know, I used to do a lot of snorkel chimney cases. This is a technique that really originated from salvage of previous repair or coverage of the renals. It's a quick off-the-shelf solution. Obviously, most people who do ZFEN realize there's a, there's a lead time that you need a few weeks to get the stent in. These are patients who come in, you know, they're patients who come in symptomatically or who kind of come in rupture and you don't really have much of an option. So this is a good off-the-shelf uh, 
uh, solution. There have been some pretty good uh, registries uh, like the Percolis and the Protagoras, and I think the data from that has been, has been pretty uh, encouraging, so a lot of us have been using them. There's really no consensus on which device to use. You know, I probably used every single device for doing snorkels and and uh, and uh, chimneys. You know, in my opinion, some work better than others, but uh, but people may agree or dis or disagree. And unfortunately, that's why there's really no consensus about this. There have been quite a few trials that have been done, or quite a few registries that have looked at uh, snorkel chimney repair. You can see the multiple trials that have been done over over the past few years. Now, this I can tell you that this technique is is evolving more and more. I think people are doing more and more as 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 time goes on. You can see the first one was 2015, and then now we're so we're just five six years into this kind of uh, this kind of a procedure. We're talking about you know how much should you oversize, what stent should you use, or what are the uh, Pitfall. So I think if you oversize aggressively, you're going to end up into some sort of uh, problem because you have you have these stents that are outside your main stent craft, and you don't really want a significant gutter. And 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 um, oversizing can lead to gutters. You know your stents can get crushed. So there are a lot of nuances to this uh, to this technique. There are some consider some considerations limiting primary use. Obviously, uh, uh, distance between renal and the SMA has to be adequate. Uh, you ha you can't have circumferential calcification. Uh, renal artery diameter has to be acceptable to to take a stent. If it's a cranial facing uh, renal artery, that makes it a little bit more challenging. And obviously, things like shaggy aorta, where you have more manipulation, you have to realize that you know a lot of these snorkels are, are put in from above, so there could be a higher risk of, of stroke when you do these kind of uh, these kind of cases as opposed to ZFEN, where really everything is done from the from the groin. So if you look at the 2000 European Society uh, guidelines, you know the tech the technique is recommended in urgent cases. Or when fenestration is not possible, right? Because for, for fenestration, technically you do need a neck of four millimeters, and sometimes you don't really have that. So this is an option to to consider for someone who's fairly sick. So what's the data on snorkel chimney versus uh, versus uh, fenestrated? Uh, when you look at the VQI initiative, they actually looked at a bunch of a bunch of patients that underwent both kind of procedures. I think they looked at about fourteen hundred patients, if I'm not mistaken. Let me see over here. Uh, yeah, they had thirteen hundred ninety six complex abdominal aortic aneurysms, and they and they looked at FIVAR versus PMAG, which is physician modified versus snorkel and chimney. And they realized that yeah, snorkel and chimney had a statistically higher rate of of stroke. Uh, uh, that was that was one of the one of the key findings. And we'll just go that. You know, the the number of centers that are doing more complex procedures has increased tremendously. Um, there are a lot of smaller places that are now doing that. Very few people are doing PMAGs now. I think that the devices have evolved um, you know so you can either do a semi charcoal snorkel or if you have the capability you can do a fenestrated so physician modified i think has probably gone down a little bit as as shown on the slide over here on the on the on the right side i think that's that's kind of uh, uh, decreasing if you look at the like a slide comparing fever versus pmag versus semi snorkel i think overall semi charcoal chimney and snorkel do have a slightly higher rate of complications right these are probably more urgent cases uh, their anatomy is probably not suitable for any other device, so the anatomy may be a little bit more challenging. And you can see the numbers are, are pretty much higher than, than most other columns, but the only statistical significant uh, column is the, is the cerebrovascular, where you may have a TIA or stroke. I've probably done about 100 of them, and I can tell you that the, you know, if you, once you get good at it, uh, the rate is low. Uh, it, it's, it's not zero, but it was, it was pretty rare that, that, that we had a cerebrovascular event. I think there's a little bit of a learning curve. And, and you know, once you plan appropriately, I think the risk of that uh, should be relatively low. So if you look at the Kaplan-Meier survival curves, I think they're all fairly similar. You know, FIVAR versus PMAG versus chimney snorkel, I think the survival is pretty good at, uh, at three years. A little bit about distal landing zone. You know, we sometimes disregard this. You know, when I trained, we used to coil both hypogastrics, stage them out, coil them, and 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 be and be done with it. But you got to realize these patients do develop some significant uh, claudication. They can have uh, erectile dysfunction, quality of life issues, and they're not uh, they're not minor. I mean, so you know, when you actually talk about these patients, their 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 quality of life can be significantly impacted. So there's a focus on preserving blood flow to at least one internal iliac artery. So the SVS guidelines from 2018, it's a 1A recommendation now. Um, so you should use an FDA branch device to, to try and save the hypogastric if possible. And the European Society also kind of mimics those, those, those same recommendations. This is a case that I did over here. Uh, you can see we, you know, obviously this patient has both and we, he, was a, he was a younger patient. We went ahead and, and, and saved him uh, that hypogastric also. He's about three years out now. 
and doing great. The the, the stents open, and he, he had no no quality of life issues. Their their data was also very good. Their their three year data shows that the pain C was for the external iliac was one hundred percent. The internal iliac, which is their hypogastric, was ninety five percent. Buttock claudication was zero. Erectile dysfunction was essentially zero. So and there was no. Uh, common iliac artery enlargement in, in, in majority of the cases. It really adds very minimal time to do this procedure. Again, we've kind, we've kind, we've gotten better and better. Probably adds adds probably 10 or 15 minutes to to do that extra part. Go to the next slide. So this is always an interesting thing, you know, open versus endo dilemma, right? I mean, the A is the open repair and kind of B is the endovascular repair. What should we be doing? I mean, uh, all of us who've done enough, we've seen a lot of failures from Stencraft. Some of the failures are pretty bad. So what's, so what's right for the patient? So here's a guy that I just did a couple of weeks ago. He has a 60, 60 year old male with a six centimeter triple A. His neck was at best, maybe two or three, three millimeters. So it was a very interesting discussion I had with, with people, whether would you just go ahead and do open or would you go ahead and do, uh, uh, do an endovascular repair with probably a fenestrated device for this patient. I don't think, uh, you know, anything else would be an option. I think snorkel or chimney on a 60 year old would probably not be the, the, the right case. So either you do a fenestrated or you do open. So when you, when you compare the data, you know, when you start looking at endovascular versus open repair, and this is a systematic review and meta-analysis of all the randomized control trials, I think this gives you a lot of, uh, lot of interesting data points. The 30-day mortality, clearly endovascular is better. We, we all know that. Even, even, in, the, even in the hospital, mortality uh, favors EVAR. I think as you start going further and further going out, and if you look at like C and D, you know, C is six months to four years, still favors EVAR, but I think we're getting close to the middle. And as you go to four to eight years, you're, that, that shift is changing. This is aneurysm-related mortality, not all-cause mortality, which, which you know, we say that is usually equal in both. But when you start looking at aneurysm-related mortality at four to eight years, you're starting to see a trend where it favors open repair. And uh, greater than eight years, so if your survival is more than eight years, then, then clearly open, favors uh, open repair. And here you go, here's a slide of that. Uh, we know this because the five-year reintervention rate after abdominal aortic aneurysm is quite high. One in five patients requires a reintervention. That's a 20% reintervention rate. So this is looking at the BQI, looking at all the Medicare patients, and they, they looked at a bunch of patients. So 12, they looked at about 13,000 patients that underwent, underwent repair. And what they found was the five-year reintervention rate was 20%, fairly high. And this is what we quote our patients too. We usually say, you know, I probably quote them about 10 to 10 to 15%. Again, depending on the anatomy of the case, right? If you know the anatomy is bad and you're pushing the, the, the limit of the device, you know you're probably going to have a failure. And the, and, the, and the late rupture was about 3% even patients who did have stent graft repair. If you did a rupture repair endovascular, the re-intervention rate was about 30%. Symptomatic was 25% and elective was 20%. Black people did worse, 30% versus 20% re-intervention rate. And the larger your aneurysm, the higher chance that you're going to have to re-intervene probably because you know, again, either the sizing wasn't correct, the neck was short, and you underestimated the neck, the aneurysm extended pretty high up, and you didn't really see that. So all, all, all those factors do come, do come into play. So I ended up doing an open repair on uh, this guy. I mean, the guy, the guy's 60 years old. He was home within a week. He's done. I don't have to worry about it. And I thought this was the wrong choice. I had a discussion with some other providers who wanted to do fenestrated. I didn't think that was the right choice. And that was based on the data that I see. The guy's 60. He's going to live about 20, 25 years, hopefully. Um, and an endovascular repair with that two millimeter neck is going to fail 100%. Or we're going to have to re-intervene or, or do something. It just, just, it just wasn't worth it. So if you look at the New England, I'm sorry, the National Institute of Health Guidelines, uh, these are published in 2020. There's a, there has been a paradigm shift. They actually say you should, op you should offer open surgical repair for people with unruptured triple A's meeting the criteria. So that means the size criteria, unless it's contraindicated because of their abdominal pathology, anesthetic risk, or medical comorbid condition. So my patient who's 60 years old should get an open repair based on this guideline because he had good anatomy for open. He didn't have any high risk factors that would exclude him from getting an open repair. So that really should have been the, 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 uh, prim the primary focus. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in the, in the, in the U.S. if there's such a big push in the in the UK to, to go ahead and do these cases uh, open. Talk about some SVS guidelines here. Elective EVAR should be, uh, should be done in hospitals that have some sort of volume. So at least 10 EVAR cases is probably the first for SVS where they're actually suggesting case volume threshold. Uh, elective open AAA repair should be performed in hospitals with a mortality rate less than 5% and that perform at least 10 open aortic aneurysms of any type per year. So if you do one a year, then you really should not be doing uh, open aneurysm um, uh, repair. 
And then obviously surgeons should use uh, endovascular or VQI mortality risk score to assist making dis- decisions about what the what the what the risk of uh, of repair is. Endovascular repair is preferred over open repair for treating ruptured aneurysms if anatomically feasible. I think there's recently been some some data, but I think most of the data supports that these patients actually do much much better if you're able to get them through an endovascular um, repair. There's some pretty good uh, upcoming technology that's coming. I mean, a lot of trials are going on. Uh, the excluder, the Zenith, uh, P branch, T branch. I'm sure there are more devices now that that kind of keep popping up, and and these are all kind of you know fenestrated devices to, uh, and, and this goes into the realm of really treating thoracoabdominal aneurysms. We're not just talking about infrarenal aneurysms, but you know once you start extending up towards the renals and you don't have a neck, then then this is the this is the technology that uh, is going to be upcoming. And I mean, for people who do open thoracoabdominal repairs. Uh, you know, this operation is extremely morbid. We've done quite a few. Complication rate is almost 100%. Uh, you're you're going to have some sort of issue. And obviously, paralysis would be the worst thing. And, and I've had a couple of patients who've gotten paralyzed after this kind of an operation. So if we can if we can salvage that, you know, if we can minimize that risk, that, that, that would be helpful. And I think that uh, ends my talk. Thank you. All right. Thank you to the speakers for a, a really, like amazing session. A lot of jam-packed information there. We're going to take like a four-minute stretch break and then uh, get some coffee and then we'll return in like four. It's 9.08 right now, so we'll come back at 9. Sorry, I take that back. Any Q&A? Any questions? So one of the things, I, I know we glossed through it very quickly, and maybe I can ask Vishal since he's standing up here, um, is we talked a lot about the patency data for iliac vessels, but I will tell you one of the most feared things in an iliac intervention is perforation. You get a perforation in your tibials. Uh, if you get a perforation in your fempop region, patient will, for the most part, do okay, but you get a perforation in iliacs, patients can die. I mean, uh, are there like particular lesions that you worry about? Um, any bailout systems that you keep in the room? Right. So, uh, I guess, okay. so for perforation, like I said, you always have to be cognizant of the fact that, you know, the degree of lesions, calcification, eccentricity, the length of the lesion is what you have to consider. And it's all about how you feel. The more you do interventions, you'll realize when you go up on your balloon, whatever size you take, like I usually recommend undersizing to begin with and then do sequential balloon up. But as in, as in how you start going up with the balloon, you have to see how the balloon expands because that's a good visual marker to say, are you going to end up in trouble or not? So if you see a balloon expanding eccentrically or if the expansion is uh, asymmetric, meaning it's not in the midline, you see that the balloon expanded in one direction and your wire is in the other side, that's a sign that you're probably might end up in perforation. Or if you if you have a little bit of out pouching in your balloon, or uh, if you see that, that's a sign that you're actually already perfed. And one of the symptoms which you always look for is the patient cries of pain. So if, if you're going up with the balloon and the patient states, oh, I'm having pain in my back, you need to stop immediately and get your balloon down. Because remember, all the nerves are in the adventitia. So that means now you're stretching, your balloon is actually not even stretching the intima and the media, you're actually stretching the adventitial part of the vessel. So once you're stretching the adventitial, your chances of having a perforation are way high up. So these are certain markers or thought processes in mind when you're trying to intervene on this iliac. And like uh, Dan talked about, I mean, the main thing 
thing is, especially when you do balloon, when you pull your wire back, like how you do coronary, the people who are doing interventional cardiology, is keep your balloon on the wire when you pull back and take a picture. So, so that way, at least you can reintroduce balloon tamponade, reverse anticoagulate, and just put a covered stent if you have to. And for Sria, I know we talked a lot about like IBL, we talked about lithotripsy. What pressures are you taking these balloons to, to your uh, lithotripsy? inflation and then um, after the pulses we post dilate very minimally another two millimeters um, j just to get good expansion so I think I think that's a, such an important point right the lithotripsy balloon is not meant to be like a pressure balloon like your regular balloons the whole idea is the pulses are supposed to uniformly crack the calcium or modify the calcium so that you can get uniform plaque exp expansion of the vessel and not necessarily using pressure to push everything out correct so I have one question. That's a good question. Any concern for distal embolization when you're doing the lithotripsy, Sri? Uh, I mean, I think the data from the Industrial PAD show that the complications from it, even compared to a regular balloon antiplast, is very, very low. The distal embolization is less than 45%. Um, so I think, I mean, it's probably even safer than in a regular. No, I agree. I mean, like Dan said, it's not really a PTA balloon to really expand your lesion. It's all about transmitting your ultrasound waves into the vessel wall, so you're not really cracking it open. And uh, because it's affecting, not really scoring, I don't think there's there's minimal uh, distal embolization. You don't have to be really concerned it's, about it. I agree. I think it's similar to regular angioplasty. If you think about what part of the vessel ends up getting significant calcification, oftentimes it's the medial layer. Right. Medial layer, as you start to get plaque, growth into the intima and you get disruption in the intima you get some of the intraluminal calcium but for the most part it's not like it's it's not like a vibratory thing that's cracking things in a significant way so i actually haven't seen any embolization with any of my shockwave cases Go ahead. one thing i'm one thing yeah, i might add yeah. one thing i might add is um we just had a rep uh from shockwave Kamtar institution they said that the, yeah, like you're saying, the point is not the four atmospheres of pressure to expand the lesion. It's more the 50 atmospheres of actual pressure by the, the lithotripsy wave that's just shattering the, the actual calcium. And most of it is medial, as you said. Correct. Uh, should we uh, go uh, directly to shock wave in, uh, as, we, as we see in, the, in this case? Or uh, we should try NEC or uh, cutting balloons first? And if uh, they didn't succeed, do we uh, go to uh, shockwave? That's a stylistic, stylistic question. I mean, Karthik, what do you do? Uh, uh, I, I personally don't ever use the regular I'm the same way. I mean, I'm yeah. typically not using cutting balloons in the iliac region. Um, for the most part, at the whole game in the iliac system is stay out of trouble, you know, to make sure that you don't perforate anything. So if you have an option to be able to kind of expand the lesion at lower pressures, I think that's my preferred approach. Right. I mean, so you have to always realize, I mean, the literature, the shock wave balloon is not a cheap balloon. So you can, you have to do the economic side of working as well. What's the viable? You have to have a selective cases selection. You can't start using shockwave on every patient. So you have to re, uh, think about the economic aspect if the patient really needs a lesion. Of course, if the patient needs it, we have to do it. But mild to moderate calcification, NC balloon, expansion, serial dilatation probably will suffice. And with the stent paper, we'll get your gradient out. So it should be due. Only in severe calcification do we really have to use it. Uh, has the shock balloon ever used for severe aortic disease? I'm talking about abdominal aorta. Uh, she is not a candidate for surgery. Uh, she would better be off with an or to buy iliac uh, grafts, but she's not a good candidate for that. But uh, this aorta is severely calcified and she's symptomatic. Would you consider a shock uh, wave? I've seen a couple of case reports. I've seen a couple of case reports where people have done have done that, but you have to have a backup plan for that, right? If something happens and you end up rupturing the aorta, then then you, you know, if it's an occlusive disease, you probably have to have like an endologic graft or something available that you can, that you can deploy. Um, and we can, you know, I mean, I think we, we'll probably talk about this tomorrow too. You know, that's a great option anyways for aeroiliac disease where you can, where you can do that. But yes, 
there are case reports. It's not recommended, but I've seen it. We've used it for like kissing uh, shockwave balloons, yes. as expensive as it gets. I mean, my oh, goodness. Yeah. But uh, and I didn't know whether or not if you pulse the shockwave balloons next to each other, are the balloons going to explode? They don't explode. They don't. It actually, <laughs> actually did okay. Um, and especially for some of those lesions that go all the way to the bifurcation that was super calcified, we used it. I understand it's off label and very expensive, but for this particular patient, we used it. Now you know why Dr. Han gets a title every six months, right? <laughs> so he's having a lot of fun with the balloons. That's how you get downgraded at Mount Sinai, actually. <laughs> all right, well, let's take a break. Yeah. All right, thank you very much to all the speakers. We'll take a quick break, and then we'll come back.